Freedom isn't either external or internal or positive or neg negative. Freedom is not something which people have, to quote Alistair McIntyre, on Hegel's view, freedom is not something people have. It is what they are. When they don't have it, they aren't. And that doesn't mean they disappear. It means they're not human without it. And so in, in Hegel, and I think, I think that for many satisfying reasons, and that's why I'm doing it today, there are many satisfying reasons to bring uh, the, the official history of ethics to a close with Hegel. In other words, Hegel's view is kind of like the last trump. It says, you give me the best moral views that grow out of your community, the, li the limitations they face wherever you happen to be and whenever they are, and the struggle to overcome those things with those goals, that's freedom. And I think that's, that will give us, I agree with McIntyre, that gives us the most satisfying view because the most historical. And it also reminds us that there's no eternal idea of freedom but only the struggle for freedom, which is consistent with Martin Luther King's remarks, because while he made remarks about freedom, the struggle for his kinds of freedoms and other people's struggles as well, Rosa Parks, whatever, were struggles for certain direct freedoms that were the overcoming of concrete limitations of a given time and place. So the challenge of freedom will be to find the new boundaries and how to break them down. That'll be what freedom will, about, will be about. It will be, well, it's a scary concept of freedom because uh, it's been glossed in the following way uh, by Engels, who quotes Goethe's uh, Faust and says that the principle of freedom here is that all that exists deserves to perish, which, as you know, is what Mephistopheles says in Faust. But it's meant in a kind of funny way. In other words, all that exists has not yet lived up to freedom, so it deserves to change perish, to give way to something more free. So there's a little bit of sympathy for the devil in Hegel's account, and I don't mind, mind that being the case. While it would be satisfying to end with Hegel's account of freedom, I must say that uh, starting tomorrow I'm going to switch the course of these accounts of human conduct, because now I've brought you up to the 19th century following various models of human conduct until we got to that most peculiar kind of human conduct, the struggle to be free, which obviously I placed a very high value on. Now, why did I do that? Because for me, it trumps the others. Whatever your project to build a character of a certain kind, to be virtuous in a certain way, or to act in a certain way, you can't do it if you're not free. In that sense, freedom is the trump card in social and political life. In other words, whatever thing you want to pursue, of all these various ways and modes of living I've discussed today, freedom is an enabling thing to do it. I mean, it will, it, it will either enable or block you, whether you're free to do it. You may be forced to act as though you're free, but to really get there, you have to really overcome obstacles. That's the concrete part of it. That's why it's very important to remember that. And so actually with today's lecture, in a way the sort of official philosophy part ends with Hegel, and we will move on to a transition from philosophy proper, where we discuss, you know, ethical theories, to a discussion of human beings as they find themselves in societies, political institutions, homes, clubs, families, and bars. In other words, folks and how they're going to get by. We need to understand that that kind of account is not mundane or beneath the level of academics or theory. It's very important. As I say, it is the condition for the possibility of higher orders of talk. All they represent, the university system, all it represents in this regard, is a very high level development of the intellectual division of labor until it's divided into such small segments that only eight people can talk to eight other people. So to sort of drop beneath that level is not to drop into something mundane and uninteresting, but is to get down where very interesting things happen. 
I mean, with Hegel, I agree that the most extraordinary things are quite ordinary. So that will be what will be the topic uh, tomorrow as we start di uh, discussing the really deviant philosophers. However, I would like to end with a note from Marx, just a little note for where we're going. Uh, all of the things I've offered today come under the heading of interpretations of human conduct as they've been developed historically. Now, I've given rejoinders about the limitations of the account I've given. In other words, it's hemmed in by certain things that I think will be, more, will be clear tomorrow. But to quote the 11th thesis on Feuerbach by Marx, a very important point to remember, and especially as a philosopher, is that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. It's very interesting to interpret freedom, freedom in various ways, but that's not the point. The point is to, is to actually walk another step down freedom's highway. So your kids can walk another step down it if we still are bothering to have them, given, you know, certain other scenarios about the future. Blade Runner, for example, you might, might decide not to have kids. Just don't want them to be cyborgs. I mean, you know, this, there are reasons people might not have children today. But, uh, no, the point is, is that well, now we're going to look at a different kind of philosopher. Uh, the ones we'll discuss tomorrow will include Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, uh, and a little bit of Kierkegaard, too, thrown in. And we're going to discuss these people because they begin to question the desire and the drive that was sort of behind philosophy in the first place. So in a certain sense, to the degree they discuss philosophy at all, it's as meta-philosophers. In other words, they look at philosophy in the way I do, as one cultural institution among others. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not a master science of what the world really means, because there isn't one. Neither is religion. There's no master discourse like that. And if anyone has one, you've got a lot better product to sell than anyone I know. Go meet Shirley MacLaine, make $5 billion in California. That isn't, you don't come to philosophy, especially today, in this sort of post-philosophical atmosphere, not for consolation. Not a good place to come for consolation. The older religions are for that. It's not a good place around some just loon like me to come in order to have your, the things you believe justified unless you have real strange beliefs. And it's also uh, a sort of a warning is that it's dangerous to believe, especially from someone that will present the picture I will tomorrow, what I say. More important that you critically examine what you think. I mean, that's the point. Uh, at least I hope it will be the point. Because, uh, you know, sometimes I don't even care what I say. Oh, that, that must be wrong. Didn't think about it long enough. So it always makes me uncomfortable to see anyone taking notes because I, you know, I don't. I don't think what I say is that important. So remember to be critical. If, if I'm up here saying, like, criticize authority, a real bad feeling is the Monty Python joke, right? Or you're saying, Criticize authority. <laughs> and given my, you know, my views of doing philosophy, nothing could make me un more uncomfortable than that paradox. 